Welcome back for a very special Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Eric Mills, the Editor-in-Chief of Naval History Magazine. Thrilled to be back with you today. Today's episode is sponsored by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies. As the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. Well, editing a magazine about naval history is a rewarding occupation, but rarely does one get a historical scoop, so to speak, something that literally adds hitherto forgotten things to the historic record, such is the case with our current issue, which um, hopefully you have, and if not, I urge you to go out and get it soon. Um, because our cover story this time is about the wild September of 23rd, 1779 sea fight during the American War for Independence. The battle that burnished forever the legend of the indefatigable Captain John Paul Jones. It was, quote, one of the most remarkable and bitterly contested battles in naval history, as the military historian Trevor Nevitt Dupuy observed. The Battle of Flamborough Head is the only recorded naval action won by a sinking ship with the victorious crew sailing away in the defeated vessel, refusing to surrender, continuing to engage with ferocity, even when your burning shot riddled ship is sinking out from under you. In this fight, John Paul Jones came to epitomize the ultimate fighting spirit for the American Navy then and now. He earned his lasting place atop the pantheon of American naval heroes in this slugfest between the Bon Homme Richard and HMS Serapis off the Yorkshire coast. Now, such a celebrated sea story has been so often recounted, you'd think there'd be nothing more to add to it. Now, thankfully, that's no longer the case. British archaeologist Trevor Brigham recently unearthed a pair of long-forgotten first-hand accounts of the Battle of Flamborough Head that offer fresh perspectives, and we are thrilled to be bringing them to the public in this issue. And joining us now from the coast of Yorkshire, England, within sight of the Battle of Flamborough Head is Trevor Brigham. Welcome, sir. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, speak to you and hopefully to our friends and colleagues in the United States. Yes, well, they'll be listening for sure. Um, in addition to talking about the um, amazing discoveries you made that this article presents, uh, we'll talk some more about some of the research, ongoing research that's being that's going on in Yorkshire there that you're involved in. It's very fa exciting to hear about, and we'll want to cover this in the magazine as it goes forward for sure. But um, why don't you start by telling us about these two forgotten accounts and how you came across them and how they may have been lost to history until now. Sure. Um, in the last few years, um, there's been an increase in interest in the battle, raising the profile over here. Uh, there's a new uh, group started in the area and they've started a commemoration in September. Um, uh, this is really on the back of uh, a discovery made by a company called Merlin Burroughs on Flamborough Head, where they actually uh, claim to have found the wreck. And of course, uh, there have been various American-led uh, expeditions here uh, since the, the mid-1970s. And the recent discoveries um, really sort of raised the uh, uh, profile again of this incredibly important event. Um, I'd been really researching the battle for probably about six or seven years. Um, and I think that uh, what happened in uh, 2018 was when they uh, uh, claimed to find the, the wreck was it, it kind of spurred me on to look at whether in fact this could be the wreck site and to actually find in, um, background information for the final movements of the Bonhomme Richard after the battle. And in order to do that, it was really to sort of look through all of the, the available sources um now some of the sources have been collated before and of course all of all of the main uh sources are well known and have been known for about 200 years and have been used over and over again by historians you've got uh, various accounts by jones himself who wrote three or four different versions 
uh, Richard Dale's account, which uh, appeared in 1825, John Kilby's, who was a quarter gunner on the, on the Richards, uh, appeared in about 1818. And you've got um, Pierre Londay, the maverick captain of the uh, USS Alliance, uh, Cotino and various other uh, shorter accounts of, of the battle. Um, but what made me look closer was the fact that in recent years, more sources have become available on, on the internet and it's possible now to search uh, newspaper accounts that have been digitized because you'll understand that you know, 200 year old, 250 year old newspapers are very fragile. And what the British Library and others have been trying to do is to digitize these and make them generally available. Uh, a lot of them are virtually uh, illegible because of age. Uh, and it, it does need an incredible amount of searching, searching to actually locate some of these accounts. Um, now, the, the account of uh, David Jordan seems to have appeared in a single newspaper, uh, the local Kentish uh, Gazette. Uh, um, and the only reason that seems to have been preserved was because he wrote from captivity in the Texel uh, within about two weeks of the event. Um, to an uncle uh, who was also a naval man. And uh, the, this relative actually then published it in the local newspaper. And being a local newspaper, it actually uh, never really hit the uh, national news. I mean, those days, as today, a lot of newspapers syndicated stories, but this doesn't seem to have been picked up by any other um, any of the national newspapers or any of the other regional newspapers. And so it disappeared really as fast as the newspaper itself went out of print. Mm. The other account was uh, uh, Richard St. Hill's account uh, was preserved in a, a series of family letters. And St. Hill um, appears to have preserved quite a, a, a large correspondence. I mean, he dealt with people like Nelson, uh, for instance, uh, when he was in charge of uh, securing supplies and uh, supplying the British fleet in the Mediterranean. Uh, he had quite a long career in the Royal Navy and uh, both wrote and received a lot of letters, which were then preserved by his son, who was obviously very proud of his father. His son, uh, also Richard St. Hill, was a famous new newsologist um, rather than a Navy man himself. But he published um, his a history of his father. Uh, around about the time of his father's death, and they were then uh, they were then republished uh, about fifteen years later. Uh, but these publications again don't seem to have been picked up by uh, some of the notable historians. I mean, uh, Paul Reevely, who is one of the main uh, historians of of the battle, uh, doesn't doesn't seem to have picked this up. I did check as much as possible that, uh, that that hadn't in fact been published before. So it did seem that we had two um, two accounts. Uh, one of them in particular, David Jordan's account, is much longer than his captain's. In fact, both of them, uh, both of the accounts are longer than the captain's official accounts, uh, both Captain Pearson of the Serapis and Piercy of the Countess of Scarborough produced relatively short, uh, very terse British stiff upper lip uh, accounts which were used in the subsequent court martial. And they, neither of those men ever seem to have published uh, fuller accounts of the battle, quite extraordinarily. Um, so we really only have the two British accounts from the two captains up until now, whereas on the American side you do have uh, quite uh, well relatively copious uh, accounts from uh, most of the leading figures who took part uh, certainly on the uh, on the Richard uh, and the captain of uh, the Alliance and the, and the, and the captain, um, Captain Cotineau as well, of Pallas. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So basically two historical stones have now been overturned and this helps flesh out the British perspective on this battle. Um, it's fascinating to see how this kind of thing can just sort of come out and then be forgotten by the world. Um, it's the newspaper account, particularly, you can see how that would happen, which makes it such a delicious find. And uh, it's such a rich, vivid account. I mean, with all the, full of all the blood and thunder of this uh, battle, which was full of that kind of thing. Um, so um, why don't we talk about that first account, uh, 
Midshipman Jordan's account. That is the, the lengthier of the two. And um, it's actually quite of a good read. I can see how the um, folks back in the uh, small town in England where it was published in the newspaper would have found this uh, gripping thing to see. And um, the fact that it never made it beyond that newspaper, which just, you know, is ephemeral. Um, I would say it's a tragedy, but it's not a tragedy anymore because you've unearthed it. And uh, it's now there for the uh, world to see and read and add to their um, insights onto the fight. And now these long forgotten um, accounts have added to our British perspective of this iconic battle. And this is, it's fascinating to be um, seeing this happen uh, in our time. Um, and I agree with you, Midshipman Jordan's account um, from HMS Serapis is just a real vivid um, filled with the action and um, violence of this particular battle, which was one of the most hard fought you'll ever find. Um, what are some of your thoughts about Midshipman Jordan's account? Um, none of this changes the historical record, but it adds to the historical record. And in that sense, it does change it. Um, and I found his account very gripping. I mean, any future historians writing about this battle are going to want to include some of his uh, insights and quotes in there, I would think. I know I would. Yeah, I think it adds a lot more fine detail to, to the battle, certainly um, when you compare it with the, his captain's account, which is very terse. Um, but I, I think a lot of it also complements um, the American accounts, particularly uh, uh, Fanning and Kilby, or I think are probably counterparts in that they have personal detail, not just uh, the sort of nitty-gritty of the battle itself in there. I mean, you know, Jordan sort of starts his account with a sheer normality of it, where they're sitting around in the wardroom having uh, having the evening meal, uh, and then the warning comes between that and the toast, and you move from that normality to a sudden uh, deafening roar of battle. Uh, and as you say, a, a very bl a bloody battle in which Jordan plays a very central part as captain of the borders, and he loses so many of his fellow men. I mean, this is kind of the, not the sort of account you'd expect um, uh, from that time when really you did just get the, the nuts and bolts accounts of the battle in captain statements, in uh, court martial statements. He provides so much personal detail. He loses so many of his messmates. You think that, you know, of the six young mid midshipmen, he sees several of them dying, uh, more or less in his arms. Uh, he loses three of his um, close midshipmen uh, companions and uh, a master mate. Master's mate. Uh, they they mess together. Uh, they've they've spent months together. They've sailed over the Baltic and back. Um, uh, and to see that, must, you know, he was a 22-year-old man. And I think you, you get that kind of account from modern wars. You would kind of expect that kind of personal detail now from modern accounts of battle. And I, and I was interested to listen to the um, the podcast you had with uh, with David about Duel in the Deep, uh, the, the December one, where he talk about, you know, two ships more or less alongside one another and that contact that you have. Uh, and again, you've got a duel happening and you can't help but also feeling a personal link to your enemy if you want to call them the enemy at that point but it's also interesting that uh, as a midshipman a young midshipman that he clearly talks to fanning um and fanning takes the trouble to talk to uh, british prisoners after the event um, and, and they obviously swap stories, their personal details of, uh, of what happens. And, and that possibly is another way that Jordan's account is very important because it cross correlates to some extent with Fanning's account. Mm -hmm. uh, this idea that you've got a big hole in the side of a ship and you drive a coach and horses through it appears in uh, Fanning's account years later. And Fanning's account is so important to the American narrative um it the detail that he has in there to see this kind of cross correlation uh from uh from the time i think is very important and i think most of the details that jordan gives do also correlate across to the other accounts so they affirm one another so you're getting a you're getting towards having a a more complete 
an accurate picture of what mm -hmm. happened. And there is a lot of confusion. I mean, the, the confusion of battle, they're shouting at one another, they're not hearing one another. Um, you know, when, when they call, who are you? And they thought that Joan shouted back Princess Amelia and was shouting the name of a, <laughs> the ship. Uh, uh, people are hailing one another. You, you, you're trying to hear um, what's going on. You've got the captain uh, standing at one end of the ship uh, on the Richard, you've got Jones at one end of the ship, uh, has no control of what's happening at the opposite end. Uh, and Jordan, I think his account, um, to some extent, brings across that confusion. I think it puts it across perfectly what's happening. Um, but also the sheer bloodiness of that hand to hand fighting that goes on, of men boarding, have been. You know, he says towards the end, they're no longer fighting really with guns, with pistols. They're actually using boarding pikes. Uh, they're down to hand-to-hand -hand compact in the most crude form. You're going back to the Middle Ages mm -hmm. in a way by the time it finishes. Um, but at the end, when it's all over, um, you get the impression that they were treated as well as possible. And that once the conflict finishes, they treat one another like human beings again. And I think that's a very important point as well in, in Jordan's narrative. That at the end of the day, although they fought like, you could say like animals, but they fought like brave, the brave men that they were. Um, and at the end of the day, they respected one another. Right. And they treated one another. I think that that's an important thing to remember in warfare today. I think that uh, these things carry through the, you know, the commonality, the common strand between it is that you. Uh, and I think that comes through in what um, what David said in his duel in the deep interview as well. That the you know the respect between the two sides. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of remarkable when you read about um, a, a clash such as this. And uh, for those of you. Um, who are sort of coming to the Battle of Flamborough Head from a sort of outsider direction. And these ships are locked and right alongside each other, blasting each other to bits. There's uh, men in the uh, up in the mass lobbing down um, incendiaries and uh, firing down on the enemy deck. It's in their they're both sides are trying to cross over the side of the other. It just turns into a melee. And in the thick of that sort of just all out brawling sort of warfare, it's almost a disconnect when you read it of how they can be so gentlemanly to one another after it's all over. Um, yet that is the way that uh, wars were fought and battles were fought. Uh, you see multiple examples of this. Um, one officer surrenders his sword to the other, as was the formality, and the other may say, well, have a glass of wine, or no, you keep your sword, you fought hard. Uh, and these, these people were just trying to kill each other <laughs> not that long before. It, it, it adds a human dynamic to it, for sure. Um, one thing that, he's, that Midshipman Jordan says toward the end of his account, when the battle's winding down, uh, basically, there's, and for all rights, uh, Jones probably should have surrendered. I mean, his ship is literally sinking. It's on fire, and he's got one mm -hmm. gun left. <laughs> he's, he just keeps on going. And the, the American perspective on that is always, he, he, you know, he never say bye, you know, Never surrender. Keep fighting no matter what. And that's sort of the, the takeaway from the battle. But there's another side to it, which Jordan hints at, with where um, the captain of the Serapis, by striking his colors as being the more humane of the two individuals because the yes. bush bill has gotten so high already. Yes. Uh, that's another way to look at it. You know, by, by striking his colors, he actually did the more humane thing. Uh, he's like, okay, enough is enough. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think there's the, there's the two... The, the, the two captains obviously have a different perspective on this because Jones is next on the line. I mean, this is pointed out, I think, by Pearson at one point that, you know, there was a man with a noose around his neck. And, of course, if Jones had been captured, um, there's very little doubt that he would have been tried and hanged. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Pearson had done his job. Um, the convoy escaped uh, right. intact. And... Um, Really, by prolonging the, the the battle, Pearson would have uh, simply been prolonging the agony. More people would have died on both sides. There's also the point that 
he was tied to uh, tied to Jones's ship. Jones's ship was he did by that time have six or seven foot of water in the hold. Both ships were on fire. They could either sink or explode at any time. There's not much um, not much doubt about that. I mean, they stopped the battle several times. I think it's Fanning uh, says that they stopped the battle on several occasions to put the fires out. And there's very little Pearson can do. He's lost control, really, of uh, maneuverability by that point. Um, most of his guns have been, well, they're not out of action, but they're having shot through and through the hull of the Richard, there's no more damage they can they can do physically to the ship. And really, um, you've got this inverted battle where the British sea would have been driven on below deck because to stay above deck um, is to invite death. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it's the opposite with the uh, with the American side that um, you stay above deck, but you go below. There's a fire. There's so really you you hit a stalemate. Right? And I think what breaks that, that this, I might be a bit controversial here, is the position of the alliance, the USS alliance, because um, there is a lot of controversy, obviously, about Londe's part in this. And you can read it either way, the, the British side and Londe's and his crew both believe that it was his intervention at the end which uh, eventually terminated the battle, whereas Jones didn't deny it that was the case and most of the the crew of the uh, Richard also uh, really stated that the Alliance actually shot into the uh, the stern of the uh, Richard whereas if you read I think uh, Jordan's account um, it's quite clear the Alliance did actually rake the stern of the Serapis and forced a lot of the uh, the crew of the uh, gun deck there to lie down to evade the fire I think what probably happened is that Londe circled several times and shot into both of them. But the appearance of the alliance out of the darkness, I think, was the point when Pearson would have realized that there was really nowhere for him to go. He was anchored. He was t not only anchored to the seabed, he was tied to the Richard. And um, there was nothing really more to gain by, by carrying on. Right. So I think that way, Jordan, I think, is, is correct that uh, perhaps, you know, Pearson did the humanitarian thing of stopping it. Uh, he knew that at the end of the day he'd be, you know, taken back to France or wherever and uh, eventually end up on a cartel and he'd end up uh, back in Britain with another command, which is exactly what happened when he was knighted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, he was. He <laughs> yeah, Frank made some joke about that, like, uh, I'll fight him again and he'll be um, elevated higher into the peerage or something like that. But... Um, yeah, if you think about it, if Pearson hadn't struck his colors when he did, they wouldn't have had a ship to get onto for them all to sail away in. I mean, yeah. they both would have sunk. So in that sense, that's very true. For those who are watching, um, you're wondering about the alliance and all of this, and Lande, he was a French captain who was in service of the Continental Navy at this point, and he and Jones had clashed this entire operation around the British Isles. Uh, there was... Definitely a clash of wills, a clash of personalities, and um, a, a very lingering sense that this guy had it out for Jones. So as he's circling both ships, as he enters the fray between Richard and Serapis, you can see how some of his shots are could hit either one. But from Jones's perspective, uh, it clearly looked like he was out to nail him, you know, out to like sabotage his efforts. But it's interesting to see from the British side that the entrance of the alliance into it uh, was like, okay, well, this is it then. It's all over but the shouting. Um, no, I'm, I'm happy that Captain Pearson did what he did because um, that's how any of them ever got away because they both would have sunk at that point. Oh, the well, other it, it, it is, in his position, I would have done exactly the same, same thing. Right. Uh, I, I think this, he did and do it, the right thing. Yeah, and as you say, uh, he did... His main goal was to um, save that convoy from being uh, the depredations of Jones. He was trying to get pull, peel off some of his convoy vessels as prizes, and he didn't. And as, as thrilled as he was by the victory, I think he was always very disappointed by that. You know, he didn't get any of those convoys, the ships, as prizes. Um, well, the other um, firsthand account is actually from the side battle of Flamborough Head between the um, Duchess of Scarborough. Countess of Scarborough and the Palace. Um, 
why don't you tell us a little about that? There's not much on that one. So I, I found this one kind of especially insightful. You always hear about the main fight between the two main ships. But this fight was going on in the sidelines as well. That's correct. I, the, the, there is very little said really about the uh, about the kind of Scarborough. It's always been relegated really to to a side issue. And um, we only have the short account of Captain Piercy uh, of, of the Scarborough himself, uh, which is really uh, in the form of a letter written to Captain Pearson in captivity. Um, and it's not added to in any detail in the court martial count, uh, which uh, either which is simply a re reiteration of uh, the two captains' accounts, they're just taken as read. So um, Saint Hill, who was the first uh, lieutenant on board, um, writes a longer account of, of the battle, and again gives more detail of what happens aboard the uh, about the Countess. Um, there's details of the. Uh, initial attempt by the Countess of Scarborough to aid um, uh, Pearson. Uh, in actual fact, it became quickly apparent that to uh, aid Pearson would probably be to, um, you'd have to f basically fire into um, a duel and you'd probably hit your own side. And what what's clear from St. Hill's account is, is the way that um, the Countess drew off uh, not just um, uh, Cotino's uh, palace, so they also effectively drew, uh, drew, drew the alliance away from the uh, duel as well. Uh, and in that way, it did provide probably more support to, um, to the Serapis than he would have done by attempting to join uh, that, that duel. And when you think that uh, Jones entered the battle with numerical superiority, um, and I think Jones was quite clear when he went in, I think, that um, it would divide so that the um, Countess of Scarborough was engaged by Pallas and possibly by the smaller vessel of Engines as well, and that the Alliance would support him um, against the um, the greater threat from the Serapis. But in actual fact, he... Uh, Quickly seems to have lost control over, over the command of <laughs> the command of the squadron. They did, <laughs> they didn't. They did basically what they'd done all the way through the voyage, which was to do their own thing uh, to some extent. Uh, and, uh, and Jones was left facing um, mm -hmm. uh, facing the uh, Serapis alone. Uh, but I, I think the the important thing about the uh, the Countess of Scarborough is the fact that she did draw off those those two vessels and. St. Hill's account uh, backs up uh, Pierce, what Pierce has said. Uh, it gives details about the number of guns uh, um, which were dismounted, the number of men killed on board, uh, the Countess of Scarborough as well. Um, it, it was a, a battle which took place about, about an hour, really, a duel between a, a ship of 20 guns and one of about 30, 32 guns. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it, it gives some personal detail of the of, of that duel. Mm -hmm. It was a second duel, which was, although not of as great importance as the main one, it uh, it certainly deserves to have much greater prominence. Really, I think. Absolutely, to have a full understanding of the um, overall scope of the battle. Of the two long forgotten accounts that you rediscovered, this is the one that surprises me more that somebody hadn't seen it at some point. Um, it's in a published, it's collected in a published book. Um, Midshipman Jordan's account, it appeared in his local newspaper and never appeared again. You can see how that would be lost in time um, until now. Uh, the other one was published in a book. And as you mentioned, St. Hill had a long uh, and distinguished career in the Royal Navy. It seems more likely some researcher at some point would have poured through his account, his recountings of things and maybe stumbled on that but it just goes to show you such isn't automatically the case and so um i can only imagine your thrill of discovery at having um unearthed these things these long lost uh, gems of uh what went on at this famous famous battle well th this is part of a larger project that um is going on over there correct that you're involved in regarding uh the history of all this and uh the the wreck itself of the bonhomme richard um 
why don't you fill um, our viewers and listeners and readers in about what's going on with that at the same time? Like, do you, as far as the rec site goes, for example, I know that for years now I've been seeing um, one dive company says they found it. Another dive company has a different site. And everybody keep this one of the great still missing unidentified shipwrecks of naval history. So we'd love to hear about what's going on with that now. Sure. Um, I think that the story of that really goes back to uh, 1975 when one of the local fishermen um, snagged his nets on a, a wreck in the middle of Filey Bay and uh, basically uh, investigated that. And they were backed up by um, some help from the US Navy and other agencies and continued to dive on that wreck for uh, um, a number of years into the 2000s. And they were. Um, they were actually appointed a project archaeologist, and the the wreck itself was um, investigated uh, up until about two thousand and two, when it was scheduled. It was actually protected. Uh, there's little doubt that it is actually an eighteenth century wreck of the same period, and it's um, been carbon dated to the central date for the carbon dating. Um, is the sort of 1770s, 1780s, and uh, the American um, researcher Don Chamet um, was involved with that, and was also convinced that it was a, a wreck of the correct period. He did stop short of saying it was a Bonhomme Richard. The problem with that is it's probably um, perhaps 15 to 20 miles from the uh, where it actually sank. It sank. The, the 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 witness accounts do say that it you know it sank at about ten thirty in the morning in full uh, daylight surrounded by the rest of the fleet and um, Filey Bay the site is two miles offshore uh, and it would have been witnessed by many more people if that had been the case you know, wrecks don't move that far underwater um, you this was followed by um, researches from uh, Clive Cussler's uh, company uh, and he, he was involved from about 1978 through to uh, the 2000s and he searched um, some distance to the north. Uh, the researcher Paul Reevely, who's an English guy who's based in the States, um, had a theory that the uh, ship um, drifted for 36 hours after the battle and mm -hmm. Kussler actually cut his dive boat uh, free and let it drift um, under similar conditions. And it drifted about 13 miles north of Flamborough Head. Uh, so he actually targeted that area and looked at about 150 square miles uh, search. Uh, this was followed by um, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration and their, and their predecessors uh, who've been looking in a similar area, but they've been looking um, something like about 20 miles offshore. Uh, they've based their search, again, on Paul Reevely's theory that the ship drifted. But they've used um, modern um, computer programs used to d detect the drift of oil spills um, or ships which are drifting without engines, which have to be found uh, by search teams. Um, and again, they're looking at a, a point somewhere like north northeast of Flamborough Head. The problem with that is, again, that... Uh, Fanning places the actual site of the battle. Um, so he says something more than a league uh, uh, south by east of Flamborough Head. Mm. And one of the things that got me interested in this was to actually look at the movements of uh, the fleet after the battle, um, because it seemed to me that um, to drift for 36 hours ran counter to all of the witness statements at the time. Uh, these are experienced seamen. They knew uh, sailing ships back to front. Um, they knew you could hold a ship uh, more or less stationary uh, in one position. You can uh, turn it on the spot. Um, to let it drift for 36 hours um, didn't seem uh, sort of a feasible kind of theorem to me. Um, and it's actually apparent when you look at the records from all of the iron witness accounts that have collated and from uh, the later data collected in the uh, the log of the Serapis, which uh, recommenced only about an hour and a half after the ships, after the Richard sank. Um, it, it's quite clear that um, 
the Richard was was actually uh, under full control, more or less, until about an hour and a half, hour and a half before she sank. Mm. Kilby records her sinking under full sail. He lists, you know, the, the fact that they had virtually every uh, sail uh, set, including a royals and uh, studding sails. Mm. Um, Jones was trying to capture every scrap of wind to get to the Texel as quickly as possible while trying to save the ship at the same time. And the log of the Serapis, which is resumed uh, at 12 o'clock, an hour and a half after the Richard sank, uh, points to a heading in that direction, east-southeast, direct to Texel. Um, so I think the idea of looking um, 20 miles to the northeast uh, it, it's not really feasible by from looking at the uh, accounts of the time. And we know, we know that um, the entire flotilla was seen uh, hovering off the end of Flamborough Head about um, two leagues, which is about you know, six, six and a half miles or thereabouts, east, southeast of Flamborough Head, uh, the, the day after the battle. And they stayed there most of that day, which was a Friday, the 24th. And they were observed to uh, disappear over the horizon about between eight and nine o'clock the following morning, which was the Saturday morning, the Saturday the 25th. And we know uh, that they were only moving about one and a half knots. And because we know the distance of the horizon from Flamborough Head, which, where they were observed from land, you can actually work out that they disappeared at a point about 20 miles from land. And we know the direction they were traveling in. And we know, mm. although there was an hour and a half gap between that and the log resuming, that they were certainly traveling in the, in the same direction that they were spotted from land uh, traveling. There was some confusion at the time that they might head north, northeast to Norway. Uh, but that was based on the running directly before the wind, which ran from south southwest. And in actual fact, um, when a, a British squadron finally turned up on the spot on the Sunday, uh, they were told that, they, that Jones was heading for Norway and promptly headed in the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, the British at the time had um, uh, something like four squadrons out, one of them trying to block the English Channel at Dover, another heading uh, west round the Scillies up the west coast to try and meet Jones if he decided to reverse course around Scotland. And two squadrons heading up the east coast, one of which headed round Scotland um, northwards and the other one headed to Norway. Uh, the British didn't actually realise uh, where Jones was headed until after he'd actually arrived at Texel. Um, so I think the point, the point I'm trying to make is that all the evidence points to Jones heading uh, east southeast from Flamborough Head. And Clive Cussler, who'd spent 20 odd years looking for the wreck to the north, uh, at the end, uh, he came to belief that it had also headed east southeast, and he thought it was between 25 to 35 miles from land. Uh, so it seems more likely that that's the sort of area that uh, they should be looking. Um, and in actual fact, um, gas pipelines and um, cabling for um, offshore uh, wind power uh, farm that's been uh, being built out there at the moment. And they've actually done quite a lot of searches in that area and there are a lot of wrecks uh, in, in that kind of location. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've heard, I think I read somewhere that that has um, complicated this search. It's, it's a little bit of a graveyard of, uh, this, of ships in that particular um, stretch of coastline there. There's a lot of wrecks down there. Well, there are a lot of wrecks. And I think uh, there were, you know, there were thousands of colliers uh, passed uh, and, and other ships passed every week in that area. And a, a, a considerable portion of ships uh, sank uh, uh, over, you know, a period of several hundred years. We actually know most of the ships which sank from about 1800, there are records of them. Before 1800, there are only records of uh, two or three. Uh, one of them, Bonhomme Richard, which we don't know where it is. Another one, HMS Nautilus, uh, which sank on Flamborough Head. It actually wrecked on Flamborough Head. Um, but there are very few uh, actually accredited wreck sites there. Um, and I think there is another possibility uh, possible location um, further south 
um, Cussler was unclear whether or not um, the, uh, Jones went north or south of Flamborough Head on his way. But um, the problem with it is it's one of the most dangerous coasts in the UK. And it was also called Submarine Alley and Torpedo Alley uh, in the First World War. Uh, some of the sites which were uh, originally looked at turned out to be World War One wrecks um, from uh, ships which were torpedoed out there. Hmm. Uh, to actually find a wooden wreck which has been decaying at the bottom for a couple of hundred years is going to be, uh, in my opinion, quite difficult. Uh, there is an interesting uh, follow-up, follow a sideline, in that... Um, Jones was off in France was offered many vessels uh, before he was offered the Duke de Dura, which became the Bonhomme Richard. Uh, one of the ships which was offered was uh, more or less a sister ship uh, called the Beaumont. Um, and he was actually, it was one of the ships in France who was actually waiting for the Beaumont to arrive back from a voyage to America, where it had been delivering supplies to the Continental Army. Um, it was under a false flag it, and it was given a different name, the Lyon. Um, now the British intercepted it uh, and took it in the harbour uh, and it sank in Antigua. And the, the bottom of what is probably the Lyon has been found recently. Hmm. So we actually have potentially a ship which was offered to Jones, another hmm. um, French East Indiaman of almost identical construction. Uh, which is being investigated at the moment. That's very so it may be that the nearest we get to one of Jones's ships is one that was offered to him uh, close to you in Antigua. Right. <laughs> George Washington didn't sleep here, but he could have. He slept next door, right? That kind of thing. But um, well, so the current status of the search is we have a general sense of where it most likely is, but there's no specific um, identified wreck site specific to a theory for this at this point just a general area where the search is now focused are there any groups, are there any groups that are actively pursuing this at this point uh yes the uh, the global foundation for ocean exploration who are based at mystic uh, connecticut um oh, sure. they um were due to come back in 2019 but it was actually um, a dispute over ownership uh, with the French, I, I believe, which is one of the things which uh, put that on hold. And then, of course, um, COVID intervened. Uh, but they do plan to come back at some time, but they'll be searching back in the area uh, they searched previously because they found a, um, a wooden shipwreck, again, of uh, 18th century date out there, which um, on the face of it, it looks promising, but again, you know, it's my belief that it's uh, some twenty odd miles north of uh, the mm -hmm. battle site and where where the ship actually uh, is more likely to have gone down if it's heading uh, heading towards a Texel. Uh, so they're planning on on coming back. Uh, they had the money raised, but the the problem was a, a legal one, which is um, you have an American uh, a, a flagged ship. Um, which is still owned by the French, which sank in British waters. <laughs> and These things actually, are complicated. That's really complicated. <laughs> well, the American, the American um, tr tradition really on this is that a sh an American flag shipwreck uh, still belongs to the American Navy, to the, uh, the actual admiral who was commanding at the time or his successor. Uh, obviously, the French view on it is that it was a French government-owned ship. It was actually owned by uh, by the king uh, and the French yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, but maybe this is the American in me speaking. I feel like King Louis bought that for John. <laughs> well, the French executed their king, so I think they, they kind of... Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not like there's doubloons on there or anything. It's just an important historic find, or historical find. Well, um, what... You're right there. You you told me before we got on the air here that um you can look out and see if you were there and at that day in 1779 you could have watched the battle from where you are on on the Yorkshire coast there, which is fascinating to think about. So uh, there must be a lot of local historical interest um, in regarding this. Um, what what kind of um. Are there any projects or anything like that you can share with us that are going on locally? in terms of the history that happened right off the shore there? Yes, uh, the, um, it, I think the discovery of 
by Merlin Burroughs um, at Flamborough Head, although it's uh, it's really a sort of ephemeral collection of uh, ship's timbers. It's an area where um, most of the uh, uh, flotsam and jetsam in uh, Filey sort of ends up, and there have been a, new, a number of wrecks down there. Um, it did um, catalyze uh, a, a local group to um, try and raise interest locally in uh, the, the battle and also to set up um, an, an information and visitor center here. And they've also, they've also started a, an annual um, commemoration of the battle. Mm. Um, in the last two or three years, uh, to raise awareness uh, locally, it's not part of our national story in the same way that obviously is in in the states. Um, but in this area, you know, the story of uh, John Paul Jones is well known. We have a, a pub down the road called John Paul Jones, and we've got a bar in Filey called Bonhams now. But they do hope to uh, make this annual uh, commemoration, building up to the uh, children' fiftieth anniversary of the battle in uh, in in twenty twenty nine. Uh, they have an annual dinner there now uh, in Filey, which uh, they have the uh, um, assistant naval attaché for the United States Navy come up from London, and we have um, representatives of the Royal Navy, and we have the, uh, um, the local cadets uh, parading, and we have like a drumhead service here now every year around uh, around about the time commemorating the event. But I, th I think the, the idea is to try and build up to having uh, a visitor and information centre to actually permanently uh, permanently commemorate this event um, there, there is a museum in Scotland I don't know whether you're aware of it the John Paul Jones Museum which is actually uh, uh, birthplace right yes the birth yes yes this museum yeah yeah one of the trustees is a retired United States Naval uh, chap himself mm. um, and, and I think this is a it's it's a great thing to do. It's something which has was mooted back in the 1930s, and I think um, to actually uh, have an annual event here, um, I, I think it cements our joint history. I think, you know, I think uh, agreed. We, well, I, I would um, ask you to keep us posted at Naval History of any developments with this uh, a visitor center or 250th event, and. We would love to keep uh, the readers uh, up to date on all this in our Naval History News section. So I look forward to hearing dispatches from Yorkshire on this. Um, all I can say is that, um, like I say, it's always rewarding to put together this magazine, but to put together it with accounts of one of America's most famous naval battles. And neither of these accounts has ever been quoted or referenced in any previous work. Um, it's been a great honor uh, to be working with you on this and getting this in the magazine, Trevor, and it's wonderful to meet you finally. And I wish you um, continued um, good fortune in your uh, researches and your efforts. Uh, they've borne some great fruit thus far. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you on today. And um, please uh, don't be a stranger. We'd love to talk to you again. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. And. Um, Cheers from America. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Eric, and uh, I, I, I hope again we'll, uh, yes, we'll speak, we'll find something else. Uh, I look forward to that. <laughs> well, thanks again and okay. take care. I, I guess that's it for today, folks. Um, here then is proof yet again that the work of history is never finished. And future retellings of John Paul Jones's famous battle will have some fresh primary source material to include. Um, with that optimistic note about the craft and art and importance of history until next time this is eric mills editor-in-chief of naval history magazine bidding you farewell